picked up on it, and um, you know, this is such a good old familiar song. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah? How do we do that? How do we rejoice and be glad? That's what we're here for, yeah? We're here to praise him. And um, I didn't figure out how I could download this, but I love this picture that I captured out of uh, The Chosen where you see Jesus and the disciples all going around dancing. And it was actually just a... um, a piece from an aftershot, a night when they had been up all evening long, all night until morning, and uh, they just got a little crazy. So um, I want to play this theme out of this is the day because this is the day. Would you say that with me? This is the day. This is the day. There's something important about today that, you know, when it's gone, it's gone. Today will pass and We will never pass specifically this way again. So this is the day to joyfully celebrate our infinite God of limitless possibilities. Celebrate, acknowledge, recognize, thank in advance. But think about that. Limitless possibilities. This is the day of limitless possibilities. This should be a motivating message. It's meant to be a motivating message, but also a very compelling message because uh, it's not just about um, behavioral modification. It's not just meant to be a message that is uh, here to have you think good thoughts and um, a motivational speech, so to speak, but to joyfully celebrate our infinite God. He's infinite. No beginning, no end, no end, no absence of power or love or goodness. That's the God who gives us uh, l- limitless possibilities. Did you grow up with your parents telling you could do whatever you set your mind to? How many grew up with parents that did that? Yeah? I see a couple, yeah? Yeah, three? The four? The rest of you didn't get that, right? You were given boundaries. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right? No, I didn't get that. And I I see that in in people that have um, imagined the limitless possibilities as a child wanting to be an astronaut or find a cure for some uh, crippling disease for cancer, for instance, and they've done all of the study and the training to go into that field, and it's amazing. It's amazing to me that someone finds out at a young age and believes with the support of their family that they have all the potential to be what they've been called to be. I'm taking a passage here from Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 19, that says, For I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. See, this, I would take this as him talking to me today and talking to you that he says, Look, I'm about to do something new. Do you see it? Can you see it in advance? How about can you believe it? Because if you can't believe it, you can't see it. Can you believe that God is about to do something new? That tomorrow doesn't have to be same-o, same-o? And that it can begin today, why? Because this is the day. This is the day to embrace what... uh, God just said through Isaiah, I'm doing something new. Come on in, James. I see an open spot right over here or there. So this is wise words to live by from the book of hesitations. Right? This is the day, unless you hesitate, then this is the day that got away. And so what the big focal thing I'm going to be talking about today is something that is a worldwide condition and, might I say, a worldwide problem called procrastination. 
procrastination, any procrastinators? Procrastinators. You have things that you should do, that you want to do, that you need to do, but you don't do them. You kick that can down the road. A lot of reasons for that. A lot of reasons. Pro procrastination can easily disregard and dismiss the Lord's commands. There's a lot of things that we're commanded to do that aren't just good advice. They are there from the Lord to benefit us and to help us to live out his purpose, his very purpose for us being here. Did you know you have a purpose? Yeah, it was assigned to you long, long, long before you ever were born. That's a big thought, isn't it? That God had a purpose for you and he foresaw that. He predestined you, we talked about this last week, he predestined you to live out a very important purpose that only you can live out. But procrastination can easily disregard and dismiss the Lord's commands, the Lord's gifts, the Lord's calling, the Lord's purpose. Do you believe that? You have to believe that because otherwise you're going to be caught in that snare. Procrastination could be disobedient to the Lord's commands. So, here's a couple of examples. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you're here, you're here to worship, you come up for communion, you put money in the offering, you're here and you feel like you're doing all of that. And he says, yeah, but I want you to wait. Because you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. And it means that you take the initiative. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister. So it calls for us to be proactive, to take initiative, to be conscious that, you know what, I've got some unsettled business. I'm not keeping short accounts. And maybe, maybe I'm thinking, well, that's their problem. It's up to them. Because there's a passage that tells you, tells me, that we should go. If we have something that we want to call someone on because it's not right, we should go just by ourselves. Do that first. And if they won't hear you, then you bring someone else who was a witness to that type of thing. And then it gets worse. If they still won't hear you, you're supposed to pants them in front of the whole church. You're supposed to expose the problem. Now, nobody wants that to happen, do they? So I would hope that any one of us who has someone who comes to us with uh, a problem that they see, that we can at least hear it. And we can at least receive it from where they're coming from before we just get defensive and deny it. But try to hear what they're telling you because it's meant to benefit you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or your sister. And then come and offer your gift. We're going to continue with this idea. We're going to take our, our lead from the Bible first. After, after all, we're here to get biblical instruction. So I'm going to start there. But there's a lot of good secular quotes and thoughts about this very matter of, pro of procrastination. So we'll take this one from the Bible. Procrastinators violate wise biblical guidance. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. It says this, be angry. Go ahead and be angry. You have reasons to be angry. But do not sin. And yet, do not sin. Do not let the sun, don't procrastinate. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. That would be procrastinating, wouldn't it? Or it would be outright ignoring. It would be outright dismissing or disregarding the wise biblical guidance that the Bible wants to give us. We have permission to be angry. Some have thought that being angry in itself is a sin. That's like money is a sin. No, it's the love of money. It's being angry and not settling matters or dealing with them before you go to sleep. 
Now, I fall asleep quickly. So, and she comes to bed after me. So there you go. There you, okay, yeah, she wakes me up. And why is it? Why is it that we're not to do this? Because we don't want to give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. He's looking to gain a foothold in your relationship and, and defeat you, uh, destroy it. We get that from the Apostle Paul. So, once again, this is the day. This is the day to take these things seriously. This is the day to ask yourselves, how often do I violate, when I'm angry, not sinning? Not going and settle ma settling matters before the sun goes down. How often do I come and do church just like the routines are, but I have something against someone, and I'm not taking that to heart and realizing that God has said, no, I, I can't receive your offering that way. That offering is tarnished. You can't come before me and act like you're giving me this good thing when you have this thing against your brother and sister or they have it against you. Go and deal with those matters quickly. It's not easy, is it? No. It's important. And Andy, I think you are a great example of it because it just bothers you. <laughs> That's what I've, what I've seen. Now, I am an avoider. I don't like conflict. I don't like being confronted, and so I don't like to do it either. Sort of a tacit agreement. I won't confront you if you don't confront me, right? <laughs> Let's just let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> well, you tell me. That's right. There's, there's real truth in that. You know, I take these messages that I spend a good deal of time on, and they continue to percolate in me. And so I recognize the procrastination that's a problem for me. In fact, I'll, I'll read a, a passage about one. It's the, one of the lengthier passages. It said, I went by the field of the lazy man. Some translations say the sluggard. And by the vineyard of the man without understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns. And its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and set my mind on it. I looked upon it and received instruction. He looks at what he sees and it's troubling him. And he's, he's kind of, it's painting a picture for him. He realizes it's the field of a lazy man. Then I saw and set my mind on it. I looked upon it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come as one who travels and your want like an armed man. Interesting translation. Uh, it's Proverbs 24, and you'll find it down towards the bottom, middle, two-thirds of the way down. So laziness can be one of the reasons for procrastinating or uh, one of the things that keep you from doing what you need to do. Now, but there is a difference between laziness and your priorities. So one thing that can be procrastination is work. You can be so busy working that your priorities are all over, out of order. I would say, Nancy, uh, you couldn't call me a sluggard or lazy, right? No? But I have a fence going up my driveway. It's the first, things people, first thing people see, but it's 40-plus years old. And someone put horses on the other side, and the horses like the grass on my side, and, and so those weak old fence posts went over. It looks terrible. And I'm thinking, you know what? Taking this to heart, I better move that up forward in my priorities, another project, another thing to spend money on, potentially another dispute with a neighbor. But it needs to be done. Yes, Ted? Never noticed them. Never noticed them. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. 
Okay, that's because you were bouncing over the bumps <laughs> and ruts. Yeah, so there are a lot of things that contribute to procrastination. Laziness or priorities that need to be looked at and rearranged. All of those things make a difference. I go by people's places sometimes and I say, whoa, that just jumps out. There is absolutely no curb appeal to that. You know, the very first thing you see is, ooh. I wonder what they're like. Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. Is that, a, a, is that completing this? Ephesians 4, 26, 27. It says, therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, and courage. So taking all these things in, into account, it's, um, you know, it's a topical sermon, and I'm taking this somewhat out of context, but it really fits the overall context. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, with purpose, and with courage. That courage might be to confront someone who is habitually doing things that you see as problems, and it's not just that it's hurting or bothering you, it's probably hurting other people and certainly hurting them. This goes on. With honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. Not as the unwise, don't live as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people. Wouldn't you like to be thought of that way? Hey, here comes that wise, sensible, discerning person. <laughs> I better hide. <laughs> Making the very most of your time on earth. This is pretty simple, huh? This is saying this is the day. Today is the day to not be like the unwise, but to be like the wise, purposeful, honorable, discerning, and so forth recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity. I want to focus on opportunity. It's such a big thing. Opportunity with, using it with wisdom and diligence. Why? You can attest to this, because the days are filled with evil. Don't be a contributor to that, because it would indicate, it would suggest that when you don't live this way, making the most of every uh, of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence, you're contributing to these evil days. You're not doing your best. You're not living your purpose. You're not doing what you're called to do. As I say, this speaks to me. Is it speaking to anyone here? Speaking to people here, I hope. I hope. I hope it holds a mirror up for you and you say, what is in this for me that I need to hear? The passages are from the Word of God. They're not something Kevin made up. They're from the Word of God, which I hold high. But is it just lip service? Or do we live it out? This is the day. Now, the only difference between this is the day, and this could have been the day, is what you do with it. Huh? Oh, this could have been the day. Oh, I missed that opportunity. That one frightened me. I turned away. I didn't want to see. What can you joyfully thank God for this day? That's a good, that's a good approach to it. What can you joyfully thank God for this day? Anything? you have a problem with that, just consider that if what you take for granted today wasn't here tomorrow, or when you go home, you take for granted that your home is going to be right there, a gift from God, this is the day that you could say, thank you, Lord, for paving the way, making streams in the, in the desert, a path through the wasteland, paving the way for the better life that you have in mind for me. The only difference is making it the day that is and not the day that could have been. This is the day, says, carpe diem. 
Any Latin speakers in here? Well, we know this one. We've learned this one by heart, huh? It means seize the day. Seize the day. Take full advantage of present opportunities. And so you have to be watchful. What, what are the present opportunities? They're not just something down the road somewhere, some days that I might bump into. What are the present opportunities? Right here in this room with the people sitting next to you or across from you, what present opportunities do you have? If you're an exhorter, you can say something positive, kind. You can build them up. You can say thank you. Thank you, Ron, for what you brought us this morning. Thank you, Bruce, for manning the, uh, the electronics. Thank you, whoever brought the snacks today. Did anyone bring snacks? Huh? <laughs> I'm, I'll thank you in advance. Well, th you know what? And this is another thing. Thanking God in advance is believing. Is believing in who he is and the good things that he has in mind for you and that he's working on them behind the scenes. Even though you, we walk by faith and not by sight. Here's a quote from someone named Victor Kayam. I don't know him, but procrastination is opportunity's assassin. You think of an assassin, a sniper who is, you know, think of Satan. He's sitting back there, he's getting a bead on you uh, because he sees the opportunity. You've been exhorted to seize the day, to look for the opportunity, and he wants to destroy that opportunity because it's part of what God's plan for you is. It's part of what God wants to see come about in his church, by his church. If I say in his church, we think that it's confined to this space and we'll be real good today, right? But by his church, that's us. This is the day to wage war on ever-present procrastination. Pablo Picasso, only put off until tomorrow what you're willing to die having left undone. Yeah. It goes along with don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today, but think about it in the bigger sense. Are there things you've left undone that you're willing to die without having done? It might be a simple conversation. It might be a phone call. It might be something in your bucket list that matters, but it's, you've kicked it down the road because you were caught in the tyranny of the urgent or something else seemed more important. Only put off in tomorrow, till tomorrow what you're willing to die having left undone. You know, at this age, I can't speak for you, but I think about the shortness of my time and that the time will be soon that there will be things left undone, things left unsaid, calls left unmade, largely because I'm too busy with other things. And so you have to look at your priorities. What are they? A few weeks ago I said, what if you had only two weeks left? What would you do differently? It's a tough question. It's a hard one to think your way into. But two weeks isn't a long time. You'd probably change some things pretty rapidly. Some things that are really all important right now. You'd say, two weeks. I wanted to go. I wanted to do. I wanted to see. I wanted to be. I'm quoting some notables. Here we have King Solomon from Ecclesiastes. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. Right? Right? And if they watch every cloud, they never harvest. I grew up on a Minnesota farm where we got cloud bursts all the time. And so you, when my dad started the, you know, evaluating what the weather was supposed to be, what it looked like, he would start the process of cutting the hay. But the hay needed other things to be done before it could be baled and loaded and put away. And so we had a thing called a a crusher that would break all the, uh, 
all the hay that was cut and put it in a windrow so that the baler could come through and pick it up and bale it, but it would expedite the drying because that cloudburst could come in a moment. And damp hay gets moldy and mildewy and actually heats up and can, I've heard of barns that have caught fire because the hay was stacked and loaded and it just got so hot. Make hay while the sun shines. That's been a, a mantra throughout my life. Here's uh, something from the psalmist. I didn't check at Psalm 90:12. I didn't check it in the introduction, so perhaps it's from David. But there were other psalmists. So teach us to consider our mortality. Teach me to count my days aright, that I may gain a heart of wisdom, is another translation. So teach us to consider our mortality, so that we might live wisely. I'm looking at my dog, and I realize her mortality, her expiration date is probably a lot sooner than mine. But I don't know that. There's no way I could know that. So we're talking about these things in the context of fulfilling our calling. And here's what Paul has to say about that. He says, since we are God's co-workers, we urge you not to let God's kindness be wasted on you. Don't take God's grace in vain. Because we're co-workers. We're not just Slaves and servants were working with God. It's his plan. He's called us. He's given us a purpose. We get to work together with the greatest person, the greatest force, the greatest purpose and plan in the universe. We get to own that. I love the book of James. It's so practical. And I, so I, I caption this, it's found at the intersection of faith and opportunity. And here it is, James 2.14 through 17 and verse 19. This is where it begins to get personal for me and where um, my inspiration for this message came from. And it says this, it, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? What good is that? Can that kind of faith save anyone? That could be taken personally. Do I have a saving faith? Or do I have a lip service faith? Can that kind of faith save anyone? It goes on, and, it's, and he says this, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, goodbye, and have a good day. Study, stay warm, and eat well. You've seen this person with no food or clothing. They're standing there at the, at the intersection, and you, and they've got a cardboard sign up, for instance, like this fella. And you go by and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well. What good does that do? Now we're talking about the intersection of faith and opportunity, where the two come together. And this is one that we see frequently. And I saw it just last week, and that's what we're going to look at. But then you don't give the person any food or clothing. What good does that do, he asks again. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. It's dead on arrival. Dead on arrival. Another opportunity missed. Assassinated by procrastination. Well, I want to draw next through that. I, will, I don't want to see... Uh, an opportunity that's dead on arrival because it's been assassinated by my procrastination. You say you have faith for you believe that there's one God. I love this. Good for you. Oh, that's good, good. You believe there's one God, so you have faith. He says, goes on, even the demons, even the demons believe that and they 
tremble in terror. It's not enough to say you have faith in, because there's one God. All right, you, you learn that. But it's not enough. You say, well, good for you. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? It's dead. So I would say this, taking it from 1 Corinthians 16, 9, don't miss your own wide open doors of opportunity. The present opportunities that are right before you, don't miss your wide open doors of opportunity. Paul saw them in Ephesus and he said, I see great doors for effectual work. But there are many here who oppose me. Your procrastination is one of those that opposes you and me. Great opportunity is right there in the present, but you don't take advantage of it. And so I'm inviting you to take the fast food faith challenge. You've heard it from me before. The fast food faith challenge. You get yourself some Burger King cards or some McDonald's cards or some place where you might find people hanging out. Now, I, I offered some of those, and I offered them with a stipulation. You see someone, and you want to do a benevolent thing and give them a card, but that's not enough. In fact, I said, if you're going to do that, don't do it. If you're going to give them a card, tell them, I'd like to buy you lunch, or I'd like to sit down and get to know you. Let's have lunch together. So I had this occasion in Prunedale. I'm going to call this a proven way to open, a proven key to opening closed doors. I'll get to it in just a second, but we've got to hear from Jesus on this because this is another one that came to mind for me. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. I mean, we have our, our, our close ones that we like to go out and, and have something to eat with, but it's saying, Jesus is saying that's not the way to go about it. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, blessed because they cannot repay you. You get that? But how inclined are we to invite that person that doesn't really groove with us and they aren't our, close, our closest people? But Jesus is saying, carpe, carpe diem, this is your day. So watch for this opportunity. You want to go and have lunch? Who have you never had lunch with? And particularly someone who isn't really in your clique or your circle. Are you getting this? Does it sound legit? It is legit. Say? It is hard. It is harder than our go-tos, the things we automatically do. And so I want to show you a selfie. It's a selfie with two men that I met in the parking lot not in the parking lot, they were laying on the sidewalk outside of CVS. In the course of conversation, I got to know the man in the middle, Tony, and the man on the, uh, your left side, your right side, Dennis. In the course of conversation, I got to know their names. While they were laying there, and I got out of my car to go into CVS to pick up my meds, um, I thought, this is the day. This is the day. I've been carrying these around for a long time and I haven't seen anybody, but I can't just drive away because this is the day. This is the present opportunity before me to practice what I preach. Yeah? You know what? That is hard to escape. It's more than a nudge. It's, okay, buddy, is this just lip service, or do you really mean it? You've got the cards in your car, and you've got something else. I had a, um, in our daily bread, and so I encourage you, 
you want to take the fast food faith challenge, arm yourself. Get some cards. I was in, at Walmart in Gilroy, and it wasn't a Burger King, but there was a McDonald's inside, so I needed to go in and buy some McDonald's cards to give to the guy sitting on the curb. But this is especially good one. What on earth am I here for by uh, Rick Warren? And it starts out like this, so it will speak to anyone. It says it all starts with God. First line, it's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born for His purpose. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. I would think that a person, I would think that Tony or Dennis, if they looked at this, would be wanting to read on. Now, I didn't have this with me. I had a daily bread. I've given this particular one before because it was part of the inspiration to do this. Every day, Glenn purchases his co co morning coffee at a nearby drive through And every day, he also pays for the order of the person in the car behind him asking the cashier to wish that person a good day. Glenn has no connection to them. He's not aware of their reactions. He simply believes a small gesture is the least he can do. That's a good one, and there's more. Because on one occasion, he encounters someone or hears of someone who tells that exact story. And he didn't know the impact it would have to pay for that person's coffee. And so I want to encourage you that you have great impact. So I invited these two guys to, to have lunch and uh, went up to the counter and ordered three uh, um, quarter pounders combos, the works, 43 some dollars later. <laughs> I didn't use their card, I let them keep their card. But I ordered this and while we were waiting for it, they go down and sit at a table for two. And I, and I go over there because what this is doing, this is the day for me to be bolder. This is the day for me to take charge in a sense. I've invited them to eat with me, and they're not accustomed to that. They're thinking, maybe I'll just give it to them and I'll go sit at another table. And so I say, well, let's sit over here while we wait for our food. And during that time, I'm able to converse with them. Uh, they're local drug addicts. They're part of the Prunedale druggies. No teeth. Tony has no teeth on top. You can't really see it so well because his whiskers cover. Um, Dennis was going like this the whole time. So he was on some kind of upper. You can always tell. And um, Dennis was the one who was most engaged, who I could e most easily engage. And I'll, so I want to say this is that a difference between seeing and meeting is called engage. So you can see someone, you can meet someone, you can give someone something, but the difference between that is when you engage them. And so this is a really important part of it. Tony and Dennis. Dennis is from Texas. He's been here four years. Tony spent many years living here and then moved away, and in those years while he was away, 18 years into his marriage, he lost his marriage. Well, what was the reason for that? You know what? Be bold enough to press in and ask the questions. Help them tell their story. Everyone has a story. Maybe it's someone with tattoos. You can say, tell me the story of what that means. Well, yes, it was drugs. Now, the thing that happened there was that not only did his wife divorce him, that was a smart move, but he lost his two children in that separation. And it deeply hurt him, and he was angry. He told his wife, if I ever, if I ever uh, encounter you, you're gone. I want my kids. Well, that led to the DA giving him a restraining order. I asked him, well, did that 
Did she put a restraining order on you? He says, no, the DA did. Yeah. It's all the same. He had to regard that uh, restraining, restraining order, but it hurt him. I can tell that. And so asking about this, if you ask people, if you ask, people will talk about themselves. If you listen, they will tell you who they are. And what I found about, out about uh, Tony was that he was broken. There was loss. There was anger. There was sorrow. And there was shame. The shame part was that his parents, his mother and his stepfather, still lived in town. And he was going into grocery outlet, my family calls that gross out, and going into grocery outlet, and there his dad was coming out. And it's, you know, dad, dad is the first one that acknowledges, and how you doing? And yeah, uh, uh, fine, how you doing? You know, and so that's as deep as that goes. Because dad would like to be reunited with his son, and his son would like to be reunited with dad, but Dennis, uh, but Tony is way, knows his ways aren't going to change. He doesn't believe he can change. And so he will never be at home with his parents. And I said, you sound like the prodigal son. See, this was an opening then for me to move into a biblical uh, um, a element of it, a parable that Jesus told. You sound like the prodigal son, only you haven't returned. And I said, do you know the story? He says, oh, yes. Well, that was information. He knew the story. He's had some Christian exposure. In fact, he's, his heart, he's, he may very well have given his heart to the Lord somewhere in his life because it's part of what's troubling him. He's not living out the life that he was called to, the purpose that God has him here, and it really troubles him. And it's wonderful when you're at the table with someone like that because they're receptive, they're hearing. And I, I talked at some length about that. We need to clarify what we hear. So if someone says something and, it, and you don't quite understand it, ask, what do you mean by that? And the conversation gets deeper and you learn more about them. See, the devil has them on the ropes. He's pounding them. But this, may, this day may be their day. It was surely my day, my day to practice what I'm preaching here today. My day to be bold. My day to take the initiative. My day to ask questions. My day to press in. My day to engage. My day to care. Have my heart, my own heart, tendered and see that, you know what? This is a key to open closed doors. This, this, these gift cards and a, a, a request that you, uh, they join you for breakfast is a key. It opened doors to meet these fellas and to talk with them. They want and need help, but they've given in to hopelessness. They need someone who will give them hope. So I felt nudged to ask about their spiritual condition and leave something behind, and that was our daily bread. And here's what Jesus has to say about it. He says, the king will, re will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, what? You did for me. That those people that you would rather just walk past, those people that you might have contempt or scorn for, laying on the sidewalk in front of the business, you wonder if the business, if that's doing anything for the business, engaging them. Here's another one found at the intersection of faith and opportunity. It comes from James, of course. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people above others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry. Wouldn't you go right up and to them and say, hey, welcome, come on in. Here's a good spot, sit right over here. And another person who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes, 
Dennis asked me, what time does church start? Now, I don't imagine, I don't know how he would have gotten here, but he asked the question, what time does your church start? Well, he's asked, first of all, where do you go to church? And I says, well, I'm the pastor of Aromas Bible Church. And, you know, uh, I think it made a difference to him that the pastor was taking time to sit with him in plain clothes, no collar, no, no other trappings. I didn't make a big point of it except that he asked the question. Another person comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. I wonder, I thought about Dennis a lot this week, and I thought, I wonder if he would come to church, figure out how to get here this morning. How would he be received by my church family. I would like to think well. I have reason to think well. I think we have moved into this dimension. We've had situations. We've had, we've had someone who came here and says, you know, you need to take a bath. <laughs> it kinda, it's kind of a put off. You're welcome here. Sit over there. No, yeah, I, I'm going to take this passage a little further. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, it made me think of how you would treat a dog. Lay down. <laughs> go, go lay down, right? It made me think of how we might treat this person like they're just a dog. So the question is, well then, all right, so we'll welcome them here, but will we invite them to lunch? Following up what was said earlier. Don't take your, your good friends to lunch. They can repay you. They, next time it'll be their turn. Take someone who has no capacity to repay you in kind, but you're repaid in a whole different way. And James says, well... Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? What are the evil motives of discrimination? Simply, I'm better than you. I'm better than you. Go sit over there. You come up and sit here. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ whose noble name you bear? I have a little piece to add to this. Uh, you might know, I, I think I shared with you that, oh, Several months or maybe better than a year or more ago, my son saw, uh, coming down 17 or going up 17 saw a car out of the corner of his eye that was off the road, had run into a tree, and he saw smoke. And so he pulled over and went down there, and he couldn't open the door, and the guy couldn't answer. And so he found something and broke the rear window and crawled in the rear window and pulled this guy out. I had COVID at the time, too, and so the, the fumes of that car burning inside had a, uh, an effect on my son, and additionally, the person was there. And so once he got him out, then uh, the first responders came, and so my son moved on his way. But he contacted him after the fact. And this was a funny thing that Tyson said. You know, I went in and saved someone from a burning fire, and he was a lawyer. <laughs> Whoa, the irony of it. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, today if you've heard his voice, do not harden your hearts. This is the day. God says, at just the right time I heard you, on the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Now, maybe, maybe it was the first step in the day of salvation for Dennis, and maybe I'll run into him again. I'll actually be watching for him. Uh, uh, I should say Tony. But Dennis also. I asked Dennis, what about you? And Dennis said, well, 
I've never invited him into my heart. Now, there was an opportunity missed. I felt the conversation had been long enough. The focus had been on Tony. There was much to work with there, and we had talked at length. But, and Dennis was kind of in and out. I thought maybe he's uncomfortable with this conversation. And he had a dog outside, and so he was checking his dog. And... But he said, I've never invited him into my heart. What do you do with that? Huh? Would you like to now? It can be as simple as what you already know. Inviting him into his, your heart. And I'm not responsible for what happens from there. I have to trust that the Holy Spirit, who I believe was working on me and in me, was also working on Dennis and in, uh, in Tony and in Tony and perhaps in Dennis. You know, Nancy, when we were in Gilroy the next day and we drove past PetSmart on our way out, there was a, a guy sitting by in the column yeah, and I looked at it and I said, that looks like Dennis, because he had a dog. He had a dog that looked just like Dennis's, and I'm wondering, how do you get up here? Uh, but, you know, uh, people are resourceful. And um, it wasn't an, uh, a good opportunity to press into that, but I could have. If I was alone, I could have gone up and seen if that was Dennis, and we'd have picked up from there. At just the right time, I helped you. The right time is now, God says. Don't procrastinate. We're almost done here. Procrastinating is, is irresponsible, Lincoln said. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. You can't just avoid your responsibility. Like this, do Monday. This guy's got something that's due Monday. His solution is do it Monday. That's procrastination. Procrastination. Jesus has a closing word on this. He says, we must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is today. This, would you say it? This is the day. Night is coming when no one can work. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Lord, I pray that the, the things that you have used to work on me, uh, words that you've given me and that I've given the congregation on your behalf that have uh, mobilized me that I couldn't turn away from, I pray that they have landed in the same way. This was just one example. It, it doesn't mean everybody has to go out and engage a homeless person, but there are present opportunities for each one here and you've defined those for them, and they know, who you, they know who you are, and they know who they are. And so I just ask God that you would open up the eyes of their hearts to show them the opportunities that they are called to step into, press into, and respond to, and build relationship, and show you to them. I pray these things in Jesus' name. We come to this point here for communion. And I think it's a good setup for communion.